All right, so in chapter three, what we're going to discuss is, is what's referred to as cell metabolism. Uh, so let's first talk about what metabolism means. The term metabolism is incredibly broad. Uh, when you say metabolism, you're talking about literally all of the chemical reactions that happen within a cell. Okay, that's technically what the term metabolism means. So, I mean, metabolism is incredibly far reaching in terms of what it covers. Now, what we're going to focus on is what's specifically called energy metabolism. When you talk about energy metabolism, uh, you're talking about these chemical reactions uh, that are specifically involved in the storage and use of energy within the cell. So the broad term metabolism implies literally every chemical reaction that can happen inside of a cell. And when we focus on energy metabolism specifically, uh, we're, we're interested in those chemical reactions that are involved in the storage and use of energy. So let's go ahead and get started with this. Um, we're gonna look at some sort of introductory concepts before we really start getting into the uh, specific pathways of energy metabolism. So to make sense of energy metabolism, there are two terms that, that one must know. Uh, and those two terms are anabolic and catabolic. Now, anabolic, is, well, we'll cover that one first. Anabolic is when you take some smaller structures and you combine them together to create a larger structure. So it could be that you're taking many molecules and you're, and you're putting them together uh, you know, to, to form some component of a cell. Or it could be that you're taking many atoms together and you're combining the atoms to create a molecule. Any time that you're taking smaller structures and you're combining those smaller structures together to create a larger structure, it's referred to as an anabolic process. And we'll look at a couple examples of those in a minute. Uh, the other one is catabolic. And catabolic is just the opposite. You take a larger structure and you break that larger structure down into smaller structures. So rather than me going on and on about this, why don't we just take a look at, a, at an example? All right, so to give an example of this, here is ATP, adenosine triphosphate, one of those uh, energy transferring nucleotides, a nucleotide triphosphate, all those terms from the past. Okay, so ATP, uh, can certainly be broken down. This is a huge part of energy metabolism that we're going to be discussing. When it's broken down, what happens is the third phosphate is broken off. Uh, and when you break the third phosphate off, you go from adenosine triphosphate, adenosine plus three phosphates, to adenosine diphosphate plus the phosphate that you broke off. These are called the, the products of the chemical reaction. Uh, so what has happened here? I, I, I'm Right now, we're not trying to go through what this actually means. Um, I'm just trying to make an example of anabolic versus catabolic reactions. We'll get into what all of this means later on. Uh, what we've done is we've taken ATP, which is certainly a larger structure, and we've broken it down into two smaller structures. We've gone from ATP to ADP and inorganic phosphate. Right? So what would we call this? We call this a catabolic reaction because we took a larger structure and we broke it down into smaller structures. Now, another part of energy metabolism is, is looking at the opposite. How do we remake ATP from ADP and inorganic phosphate? How do we take these two and recombine them to create ATP? Huge part of energy metabolism. Um, Without getting into how all of that is made, because that's going to take you know, multiple hours to discuss here, um, one hopefully can see that if you take ADP and inorganic phosphate and you combine them together, you're taking two smaller structures and you're combining them together to create ATP, which is a larger structure. Right? So this must be an anabolic reaction. 
Right? This is an anabolic reaction because two smaller structures, ADP and inorganic phosphate, are being combined to create a larger structure, ATP. Okay? So there's just a basic example of anabolic and catabolic reactions, and we're going to spend much time uh, actually looking at um, this particular process uh, within this chapter. So a little bit more uh, definitional things for you, basic concepts for you. Um, we talked about anabolic and catabolic, and now we're going to talk about what are called exergonic and endergonic reactions. Before I talk about exergonic and endergonic reactions, I want to just tell you what is always involved in a chemical reaction. Okay. Uh, because what we're about to discuss here are chemical reactions, which involve discussing reactants and products. And I think making, making sure that everybody is familiar with what makes up a chemical reaction before we get into exergonic and endergonic would probably be quite beneficial. For something to be a chemical reaction, you need what are called reactants and you need products. Okay. What's the simplest way of, 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 of saying this? Um, first of all, the reactants will always be first in line and the products will always be second in line. Um, another way of thinking about this, I, I'm trying to go from simple to complex, um, is the reactants will always become ultimately the products. Okay. And that's always true, but the, the big thing here technically that a reactant is, is it is ultimately the substance within the reaction that actually undergoes a change. Okay. That can be harder to remember. Okay. But the, the reactant, let's go through it, is, is first in line. It's always ultimately going to become the products. And the true definition of it is it is the uh, substance in the reaction that undergoes change. Now, what about the products? The products, on, a, on the simplest level, are, are always what's second in line. Okay? Um, beyond being second in line, um, the, the products used to be, or uh, portions of them, were ultimately the reactants. The products are, are ultimately formed from the reactant. That's actually the definition of, of products, is these substances that are uh, ultimately formed in a chemical reaction. So now let me give you an, ex an actual example of this without talking about what, whether it's exergonic or endergonic or any of that, let's just make sense of the terms. Okay? So first of all, here's ATP. You've seen this already. ATP in this example is in fact the reactant. It's first in line, it's going to ultimately uh, become the products. And the most important thing here, although it can be the most challenging to remember, is it is the structure that's actually going to undergo a change. All right, so ATP is the reactant. Now, ATP is going to become the products in this example. What are the products? You've seen this already. ADP and inorganic phosphate. In this chemical reaction, ATP becomes ADP and inorganic phosphate. Do you see how ATP was first in line and it underwent a change? That's what makes it the reactant. Now, why are ADP and inorganic phosphate the products? Well, again, they're second in line in the reaction. That's the Ultimately, the products always will be second in line. But the big thing is, the products are always what are formed in the chemical reaction. And they're formed from um, the reactant. Okay. So this is the definition of, of, a chemical of, of a chemical reaction as it relates to reactants and products. Um, I, I think just the terms reactants and products actually confuses a, a lot of people for, you know, uh, what I would consider uh, understandable reasons. So one more time, the reactants will always be first in line and they are the structure that's 
going to undergo a change. The products will always be second in line, and they are ultimately what's formed in the chemical reaction, and they're formed ultimately from the reactant. So that's the basics of a chemical reaction, and now let's differentiate between what makes something exergonic and endergonic, and this is going to involve discussing, of course, uh, reactants and products again, but hopefully now you at least already know what they are. Oh, why don't we just define what makes something an exergonic reaction? In an exergonic reaction, energy is always released. Okay? What's called the delta E is going to be negative. That implies that there's actually energy being released into the cell. All right. So, first of all, what's an example of an exergonic reaction? You actually just saw it without me telling you. Uh, when you turn ATP, into ADP, an inorganic phosphate, energy gets released into the cell. This is referred to as an exergonic reaction. Now, what makes this an exergonic reaction? In order for something to be an exergonic reaction, the reactants have to have more energy within them than the products. Now, in this example, there's only one reactant, but there can be multiple reactants and there can be multiple products or one product. Uh, it all depends upon the circumstance. But what I can promise you is that always in an exergonic reaction, the reactants, or in this case, the reactant, has more energy within it than the products do. Okay, so with this specific example, what are we seeing here? ATP, which is the reactant, first in line, and it's what's going to undergo a change, it has much more energy stored within it than either ADP or inorganic phosphate does. So when you turn ATP into ADP and inorganic phosphate, energy is going to be released into the cell. Because ATP has much more energy within it than either ADP or inorganic phosphate does. So if you take ATP and you turn it into ADP and inorganic phosphate, you're turning a uh, structure, ATP, which has a lot of energy within it, into two other structures, ADP and inorganic phosphate, which have lo much less energy within them, and thus the energy difference will actually then be released into the cell. And by that I mean the energy difference between the reactant, which is ATP, and the products, which are ADP and inter inorganic phosphate. The energy storage difference between these structures, the reactants and the products, that difference will actually be released into the cell and then the cell can actually use that energy for uh, cellular processes. So you already know what makes ATP, the reactant, and ADP and inorganic phosphate, the products. So I won't go back through that whole thing. That's not, I hope that's not necessary. But because of the fact that ATP, the reactant, has much more energy within it than ADP and inorganic phosphate, the products, energy will be released when ATP is turned into ADP and inorganic phosphate. And thus, the reaction is exergonic. So the next reaction that we're going to look at are what are called endergonic reactions. Endergonic reactions are the opposite of exergonic reactions, which hopefully will make them a little easier to understand. Although the example that I give, uh, I think, tends to throw people off a little bit. Uh, but I think that's also good because it'll make you think a little bit. So if endergonic reactions are the opposite of exergonic reactions, then clearly in the chemical reaction, energy is not going to be released. You're actually going to need energy in order for the reaction to occur. So first of all, what is the example? Well, we're going to take ADP and inorganic phosphate and recombine them together to create ATP. This is an endergonic reaction. Why is it endergonic? Because we actually need energy we need to put energy into this reaction in order for it to occur. In, in order for this reaction to actually happen, we're actually going to have to put energy into it. 
That's what an endergonic reaction is. It's the opposite of an exergonic reaction. When exergonic reactions happen, energy is actually released into the cell. So why would we need to put energy into this reaction? And the answer to that ultimately is because the reactants, and the reactants in this case are ADP and inorganic phosphate, actually have less energy within them than the products do, in this case product ATP. Always in endergonic reactions, the reactants have less energy within them than the products do. So you already know that ADP and inorganic phosphate have less energy within them than ATP does. So if you want to take ADP and inorganic phosphate and create ATP out of them, right, you're taking structures that have less energy within them and wanting, them, wanting to turn them into a structure that has more energy within it. So clearly to accomplish that, you're going to have to put energy into the reaction. Another way of saying this is you're going to have to go uphill, right, to turn the reactants into products. That is always what's going to make something endergonic. The reactants have less energy within them than the products, so energy is going to have to be added to the chemical reaction in order for it to occur. What's called the delta E is going to be positive. The value will be positive because we're actually having to put energy into the reaction in order for it to occur. Now let me expand on this a little bit and, and explain why it confuses people. In the example I'm giving, ADP and inorganic phosphate are serving as the reactants. Now in my last example, they were the products. How can a reversal like this happen? And it requires you, and honestly, this might be more important than anything else that, that we've discussed related to endergonic and exergonic reactions. Um, there's, there's clearly been a role reversal here, and you have to know the definition of reactants and products to understand why. In the first example, the exergonic example, ATP was turned into ADP and inorganic phosphate. ATP was first in line, and it was the structure that was undergoing a change. So it had to be the reactant. And, AT, and ADP and inorganic phosphate were second in line, and they were what were formed from the reaction. So they must have been the products. But now in this example, we have a complete reversal, and this happens all the time in chemical reactions. Uh, what you're seeing here is now ADP and inorganic phosphate are the reactants. Now, how could they be the reactants? Because the last example, they were the products. They are now the reactants, one, because they're first in line, right? Something's first in line, it's got to be a reactant. And the other thing is ADP and inorganic phosphate, this is actually the true definition, that's a little harder to understand. Um, these are the structures that are going to undergo change within the reaction. Right? So if ADP and inorganic phosphate are first in line and they're going to undergo change, they must be the reactants. Now how is ATP ultimately going to be the product? Because in the last example, it was the reactant. Right? Why is it now the product? Well, because ATP is second in line and ATP is what is formed from this chemical reaction. So ATP must now be the product of the reaction. It's the product of the reaction because it's second in line and it's, more importantly, what is formed from the chemical reaction. That is how you can get this role reversal. It's a definitional thing, but it's an incredibly important definitional thing. The reactants will always be first and they will always be the structure that undergoes a change. The products will always be second and they will always be what are formed from the chemical reaction. So I hope you can see why this makes sense. This is honestly what's more important and it's the harder part to understand. The easier part is what makes something exergonic or endergonic, right? Exergonic just means always that the reactants 
the reactants have more energy within them than the products and energy is going to be released. Endergonic is the opposite. The reactants have less energy within them than the products and you're gonna to have to add energy into the reaction. I don't think that those are terribly hard definitions, but understanding why something is a reactant and a product in a chemical reaction, um, I think that's the harder part. So when you define exergonic and endergonic, um, it makes it seem as if these reactions are mutually exclusive, which couldn't be any further from the truth. Exergonic and endergonic reactions are almost always linked or coupled to each other. So let me give you an example. Here is a molecule of sugar, also known as glucose. What are we gonna do with glucose, first of all? The cell is gonna run it through this process called glycolysis, which we're gonna look at in its entirety in a little bit. Uh, but the cell is going to take glucose and it's going to break glucose down into a bunch of carbon dioxide and water. So first of all, let's establish what's the reactant and what's the product. There's a lot of reactions that are involved in this. So there's lots of reactants and lots of products ultimately, but we're simplifying a little bit. So glucose is first in line and it is the, the structure that's going to be transformed. So it must be the reactant. Now water and carbon dioxide, they're second in line. And additionally, uh, they are what are actually produced from this reaction. So th they must be the products. Glucose is the reactant and uh, carbon dioxide and water are the products. Now, this is also certainly a big exergonic reaction. There's much more energy that exists in glucose than in carbon dioxide and water. So when we turn glucose into carbon dioxide and water, lots of energy is released. So the conversion of glucose into carbon dioxide and water is of course exergonic. The question is, what are we gonna do with that energy that is released from turning glucose into carbon dioxide and water? And the answer is we're gonna use that energy in order to turn ADP and inorganic phosphate back into ATP. Why is that necessary, right? Because, well, first of all, ADP and inorganic phosphate in this example are in fact the uh, reactants. Why? They're first in line and they're what are gonna be transformed. ATP is the product. Why is ATP the product? It is second in line and it is what is formed from the reaction. Now, this is of course an endergonic reaction. Why is it endergonic? Because there's, lots, there's much less energy in ADP and inorganic phosphate than there is within ATP. So in order to turn ADP and inorganic phosphate into ATP, energy is going to have to be added into this reaction, which is what makes it endergonic. Now the question is, where does that energy come from? And hopefully you can see from this image where the energy comes from. The energy comes from the breakdown of macronutrients like glucose. So let's be more specific about how an exergonic reaction is coupled to an endergonic reaction. We have already established, established when we take glucose, which is the reactant, and we turn it into carbon dioxide and water, which are the products, energy is released. This is an exergonic reaction. Okay. Now, what needs that energy? Where can that energy be used by the cell? The answer is, to turn ADP and inorganic phosphate, which are the reactants, back into ATP, which is the product. The major point here is this, the cells of your body constantly need to be regenerating ATP, always. Every cell in your body constantly has to, every, you know, certain cells need to regenerate more than others, but every cell in your body needs to constantly be regenerating ATP. It's absolutely essential for survival.
but the regeneration of ATP from ADP and inorganic phosphate is an endergonic reaction, meaning the cell is constantly going to need a supply of energy in order to be turning ADP and inorganic phosphate back into ATP. Now, where is that energy going to come from? It's going to come from the breakdown of macronutrients inside of your cells. Think about it. When your cell, let's say this is a muscle cell. When your muscle cell takes glucose and breaks it down into carbon dioxide and water, lots of energy is released. That's an exergonic uh, reaction. And the energy that comes from breaking down uh, glucose into carbon dioxide and, and water, that energy is used to turn ADP and inorganic phosphate back into ATP. So the energy from an exergonic reaction is used to power an endergonic reaction. Exergonic and endergonic reactions are almost always coupled to each other. You need the energy from the exergonic reaction, turning glucose into carbon dioxide and water, in order to power the endergonic reaction, turning ADP and inorganic phosphate back into ATP. You always need energy. You always need to put energy into endergonic reactions. And where do you think that energy comes from? It has to come from somewhere, and it comes from exergonic reactions. Now, as I said, this, is a, this image here is a big oversimplification of how this actually works, but the overarching principle is accurate. Okay? You're going to see that exergonic and endergonic reactions are coupled to each other um, again and again and again throughout the course of, of the semester. All right, next, oxidation reduction reactions. Um, this can be made to be so much more uh, complex than it actually is. What makes something an oxidation reaction and what makes something a reduction reaction? Let's look at a simple diagram to see what makes something oxidation uh, what makes something an oxidation reaction and what makes something a reduction reaction? First of all, let me give you a little bit of context. Like, why are we talking about oxidation reduction reactions? Well, because ultimately when we look at like glycolysis, which as I just said to you largely is a, is a very exergonic process, these oxidation reduction reactions are going to be fundamental to the way that it actually happens. And we'll make sense of all that uh, as, as, as and when we get there. Anyways, if something is oxidized, it loses electrons. That's always how, that's always what an oxidation reaction is. If something is oxidized, it loses electrons, period. That there's, no, there's, <laughs> there's really no other definition of an oxidation reaction. And if something is reduced, it gains electrons. So yet again, like last time with exergonic and endergonic, you can clearly see that these things must be coupled to each other. So let's give an example. Here is a compound A, which has two electrons. Here is compound B with no electrons. Let's pretend that compound B comes over to compound A and steals the two electrons from it. This would be what's called an oxidation reduction reaction or a redox reaction. Why? What, why, what makes this an oxidation reduction reaction and who's been oxidized and who's been reduced? First of all, molecule or compound A has been oxidized. Why? Because compound A has lost two electrons, right? If a compound loses electrons, it has been oxidized. So compound A, since it's lost electrons, has absolutely been oxidized. Now, what about compound B. Compound B took two electrons from compound A, so now compound B has gained electrons. So compound B, we would say, has been reduced. This is as simple as it gets in, in chemistry. Always, if something loses electrons, 
it has been oxidized. In this image, compound A is oxidized because it loses electrons. If something gains electrons, it has been reduced. You can clearly see that compound B has been reduced because it gained electrons. Also, hopefully you can see why these reactions are really, they're, they're always coupled to each other. I was trying to think, and you know, like, is there ever an example where there's an oxidation reduction reaction that's not coupled? Um, and um, maybe there's some mysterious example of when one does happen, but to my knowledge, it's it, it, they're never not coupled. If something is oxidized, then something else is reduced, right? If something loses electrons, then something else must have gained electrons. That's why we really almost never isolate isolate the reaction and just call it an oxidation reaction or a reduction reaction. Oftentimes these are called redox reactions because there's both an oxidation and a reduction reaction that happens um, at the same time. Now how this actually happens within our cells um, is a little bit different than this. I'm gonna show you the main thing that we're gonna look at with like glycolysis. When we actually see oxidation reduction reactions happen inside of our cells, usually it's actually through the removal of hydrogens, and I can quite easily explain that. So if you look at a hydrogen atom, we've already talked about hydrogen atoms. What do they have? They have one positively charged proton in its nucleus and one negatively charged electron uh, in its first shell. That's what makes something a hydrogen. Think of a glucose molecule. A glucose molecule has lots of hydrogens. So the point is, what if you were to strip off a whole bunch of hydrogens from a glucose molecule? Okay. Here are some hydrogens here. What if we were, this is uh, malate. Right? Let, let's take malate. Pretend it's glucose. It doesn't matter what structure it is. But take any structure that has hydrogens. Maybe it's glucose, maybe it's malate, and then remove some of those hydrogens. If you remove some of those hydrogens, um, from glucose or from malate, what have you also taken away from it? You've taken away electrons. In this example that's given to you here, we're turning malate into oxaloacetate. Okay. We're, we're stripping ultimately two hydrogens off of malate. If we strip two hydrogens off of, of malate, what has malate also lost? It has also lost two electrons. So what's happened to malate as we turn malate into oxaloacetate? The answer is clearly it's been oxidized. Malate is oxidized here because it loses two electrons. It's just losing those electrons in the form of hydrogens. This is what really typically happens within our cells. When molecules get oxidized, oftentimes they lose hydrogens to something else. Um, but regardless, the loss of those hydrogens means that they've actually lost electrons. That's what's going to happen to glucose, too. As glucose runs through this process called glycolysis, we just keep stripping hydrogens off of it. And as we strip hydrogens off of it, what's glucose losing? It's losing electrons. So it is, of course, being, um, it's being oxidized. Now the question is, like, what I said that oxidation reduction reactions are almost always uh, coupled or linked. So what's being reduced? Oftentimes it's this molecule called NAD or there's another one called FAD2. We'll get into what they actually are a little bit later. But if you look at NAD, NAD is what actually gets reduced. So in this reaction, when we turn malate into oxaloacetate, what happens is NAD comes along and it is what actually takes the two hydrogens from malate. And now NAD has some extra hydrogens and it's called NADH because it gained actually two hydrogens. It carries one of the other hydrogens in kind of a weird way, but that's neither here nor there for, for uh, this conversation. The point is NAD is what actually gained those two hydrogens or took those two hydrogens from malate. So what would we say about NAD as it becomes NADH? NAD is reduced in this example because it gains two hydrogens.
which means that it really gained two electrons. So the point that I'm trying to make here is oftentimes in our cells, when molecules actually get reduced, what actually happens is they gain hydrogens. But within those hydrogens, there are electrons. So technically those molecules have gained electrons in the form of those hydrogens. So they have in fact been reduced. That's the main way you're gonna see this play out throughout the course of these lectures. These are other reactions you're gonna to see too, but you've already seen these. I already actually went through them in their entirety. So I'll just mention them briefly. Hydrolysis reactions versus condensation reactions. I, we went through these in detail, but you're in chapter two, but you'll see these um, many times throughout the course of metabolism and in other chapters of, of the textbook. Um, anytime that you have hydrolysis reactions, you're bringing water into the reaction, um, usually to split something apart. So if you have sucrose, which is table sugar, water actually comes into the reaction to split uh, sucrose, which is a disaccharide, into glucose and fructose, which are monosaccharides. Okay. Now with, with condensation reactions, um, water is actually down here. If, with condensation reactions, water is, is actually extracted from the reaction. It's not brought into the reaction. So for example, if you wanna combine glucose and fructose to make sucrose, table sugar, um, what you can happen is water can actually be extracted, which we refer to as a condensation reaction. Water, H2O, two hydrogens and an oxygen atom are actually removed uh, within the reaction. And that brings two structures together. So through a condensation reaction, glucose and fructose are actually, two monosaccharides are actually brought together to make sucrose a disaccharide. And in that reaction, uh, water is, is, is actually extracted um, or, or formed uh, in order for the reaction to occur. You're going to see hydrolysis and condensation reactions uh, plenty of times. They're actually part of some of the reactions that I've already gone through. I just haven't mentioned it yet. Another one that you're gonna see a lot of that you've actually seen some of already, but I just haven't mentioned it, are phosphorylation and dephosphorylation reactions. Um, let's just say this, with phosphorylation reactions, a phosphate is added to a molecule or to a structure. So if you take ADP and you add an additional phosphate to it to make ATP, that is actually a phosphorylation reaction. You're gonna see lots and lots of different phosphorylation reactions throughout the course of the semester. It just means the addition of a phosphate. And dephosphorylation clearly means the opposite. When you take ATP and you strip a phosphate off of it to make ADP an inorganic phosphate, that's a dephosphorylation reaction because ATP has actually had a phosphate extracted or removed from it. Okay. These are phosphorylation and dephosphorylation reactions. You will see plenty of examples of these. Next, what we wanna talk about are enzymes. And in order to do that, uh, what we need to do is, for a second, look at an exergonic reaction again. So in an exergonic reaction, again, you have reactants and you have products. Every chemical reaction does. The reactants have more energy than the products do. Um, so when the reactants are turned into the products, the energy difference is released. But while these reactions do tend to be spontaneous, meaning that they're downhill, right? The reactants have more energy than the products. So the reactants have a natural tendency to become the products. Um, that's always true with exergonic reactions. There's still this thing called an activation energy barrier. Um, so while there is a natural tendency for reactants to become products in exergonic reactions, simply because of the fact that the reactants have so much more energy within them, than the products do, there's a natural tendency to go downhill, there's still a barrier that the reactant has to overcome in order to become the product in an exergonic reaction. And that's called this activation energy barrier. Um, you can kind of think about it this way, even in an exergonic reaction, 
like this. Let's say that the reactants are ATP, and the products are ADP and inorganic phosphate. That's what we talked about. Um, even though that there's a even though there's a natural tendency for this reaction to occur because it's exergonic, there's still essentially a small amount of energy that needs to be put into this chemical reaction at the start in order to turn ATP into ADP and inorganic phosphate. There's a little hump that you have to get over in order for ATP to become ADP and inorganic phosphate. And that might seem simple, but sometimes uh, it could take hundreds of years for the reactant to overcome that activation energy barrier to become ultimately the products and release the energy. So we need things, structures, molecules inside of our cells to propel these exergonic reactions and actually make sure that they happen by reducing or almost eliminating what's called this activation energy barrier. And what's going to accomplish this are what are called enzymes. Here, you can see this for yourself. This is almost how this is always is depicted. This is clearly an exergonic reaction. The reactants, you can think about it as being ATP, have much more energy within them than the products, ADP and inorganic phosphate. Uh, but there's still this barrier this energy barrier that ATP needs to get over in order to actually become ADP and inorganic phosphate. Um, it's, it's a small amount of energy, it's not always that small, that actually has to be put into the reaction in order for that reactant to become the product, even if it's exergonic. Um, and like I said, sometimes it, it could literally take hundreds of years inside of a cell in order for a reactant to overcome that energy energy barrier. So what we have are these things called enzymes. And what an enzyme will do is it will lower, or like I said, almost completely eliminate the activation energy barrier. And that will allow for the reactant to actually become the product um, uh, over a much faster time span. As an example, without an enzyme, there's an enzyme called ATPase, actually, that helps break ATP down into ADP and inorganic phosphate. It might take ATP 50 years to actually finally turn into ADP and inorganic phosphate. It might take 50 years to overcome that uh, energy barrier. But with this enzyme called ATPase, it might take half a millisecond, or actually probably much, much less than that. Right. So what what the enzyme has done is it's lowered substantially to the point of, again, basically eliminating the activation energy barrier so that ATP can actually become ADP and inorganic phosphate. Rather than taking 50 years, it can be done in one one millionth of a millisecond. That might be a uh, more accurate uh, time differential between the two. So enzymes in our body uh, are phenomenally important. They significantly speed up the rate at which chemical reactions can occur by lowering energy barriers. This is a very uh, simplified image of how enzymes work. You have an enzyme. What the enzyme does is it combines with the substrate, which the substrate for all intents and purposes is the reactant. So the enzyme combines with the substrate or the reactant. Those, you, those two words can really be used synonymously. Um, and it forms this enzyme substrate complex, or think about it as enzyme reactant complex if you want. Um, and it lowers the energy barrier. And what will happen is that substrate or reactant will very quickly then become the product. Um, in this case, the substrate or reactant would be ATP. The enzyme, as I said, would be ATPase and uh, the enzyme ATPase and the substrate or reactant ATP would combine together. The energy barrier would be lowered and then very quickly ATP could become the products of ADP and inorganic phosphate. And additionally then you'd have the free floating enzyme again, which could then go find another substrate or reactant. And what I mean by that is another molecule of ATP. So there's still a lot of debate 
around the way that enzymes work. Like, how does an enzyme actually um, bind to a specific substrate or reactant and turn it into its product? Um, there's, there's really kind of two theories. One of them is much older than the other and also probably much less accurate than the other, but we're gonna go through both of them. The first one is the lock and key model. The lock and key model says, okay, so here's an enzyme. And the enz every enzyme is going to have what's called an active site. The active site is where the enzyme actually binds the substrate or reactant. And in this example uh, of, a, of with the lock and key model, the active site of an enzyme has an incredibly specific shape to it. And that shape is organized in such a way that it will only bind to a specific reactant or a specific substrate. So let's pretend that this is this ATPase enzyme. Okay? Um, these are all different reactants. Okay, uh, substrate D is, um, let me just start making things up here. This is calcium um, over here, substrate B, that is, uh, let's say, uh, glucose. And substrate A, we'll say substrate A is, um, well, let's say it's malate because you looked at you saw that one before and then substrate c is atp okay. the enzyme here is the atpase enzyme it's what binds atp and lowers its energy barrier so that it can become adp and inorganic pho uh, fast phosphate at a faster rate um, so this atpase enzyme must have an incredibly specific shape so that it only fits and binds on to ATP. Look at it. Its active site, the place where it actually binds the substrate of the reactant, is shaped in a way so that it only can fit ATP. It can't fit in it can't fit or attach to calcium. It can't fit or attach to glucose or malate uh, because its shape won't bind calcium, glucose, or malate. It will only bind on to ATP. Okay. And that would tell us why, for example, the ATPase enzyme can only bind ATP and not other substrates or reactants. That's the, the basics of, uh, or the basis, I should say, of the lock and key model. Every enzyme has an incredibly specific shape to it so that it can only bind onto a specific, uh, basically, reactant or substrate. So the more recent theory about enzymes and probably partly more accurate theory about enzymes um, is what's called the induced fit model. The induced fit model uh, implies, first of all, the structure of the enzyme is the same. The enzyme um, is organized so that it has a specific active site that actually binds the reactant or the substrate. Okay, so that doesn't change. But what does change in the induced fit model is the fact that the active site has the ability to change shape. If you look at the image, uh, the enzyme's active site is, is square, right? And the reactant or substrate is spherical, right? So it doesn't look like this enzyme should be able to bind that reactant or substrate. But what happens is, the substrate or reactant comes into the re to the active site of the enzyme, and then the active site actually changes shape to fit that specific substrate or, or, or reactant. That's where the induced fit model comes from. The active site actually has the ability to change its orientation once the reactant or substrate binds to it. Um, and then, of course, it turns the reactant or substrate into, into the product, um, and then what happens is the enzyme, the enzyme's active site then returns back to its original orientation that it started with. Now you might say like, what's the benefit of the enzyme being able to, to actually do this? Like what, what would be the benefit of this? The benefit would be that the enzyme actually has the ability to bind multiple different reactants um, or substrates, and not just one. For example, we know a lot of reactions are reversible. By that I mean you have a specific um, 
you have a specific reactant that becomes a product. And then that, that exact reaction can reverse. This actually doesn't happen um, with, with ATP. But let me give you an example of, of one where it does. Okay, so you're going to see this molecule um, that is referred to as pyruvate. And pyruvate can become what's called lactate. Okay? And the enzyme that accomplishes this is something called lactate dehydrogenase. Okay? So pyruvate gets turned into lactate thanks to the help of this enzyme lowering the activation energy barrier. And then what can actually happen is this exact same enzyme can take lactate and turn lactate back into pyruvate. That creates some serious problems for ultimately that lock and key model. Because in the lock and key model, this would be impossible because the lactate dehydrogenase enzyme would have an incredibly specific shape so that it could only bind pyruvate. Then it would turn pyruvate into lactate and you would never be able to turn lactate back into pyruvate with this same enzyme because the lactate dehydrogenase enzyme wouldn't have the right active site to actually bind lactate because lactate is a different structure than pyruvate, right? They're different molecules. So if the lactate dehydrogenase enzyme were in the lock and key model, um, there'd be no way to reverse this reaction because lactate dehydrogenase would have no ability to bind lactate which has a different shape than pyruvate. But we know that this does happen. What happens is the lactate dehydrogenase enzyme can definitely bind lactate and turn lactate back into pyruvate. That must mean that there's some variability to the lactate dehydrogenase enzyme's active site, right? The, the active site must be able to shift its shape so that it can bind both pyruvate and lactate. That's the only way that this would, of course, make any sense. Now, it is true that the lactate dehydrogenase enzyme is really only capable of binding pyruvate and lactate. It's not capable of binding thousands of different reactants or substrates. It's only capable of, of binding a couple. So even in the induced FIT model, the all the enzymes right have active sites that still can only sh shift to a small degree to bind a, a very finite number of substrates or reactants but the induced fit model definitely tells us that there's some degree of variability that the active site of any given enzyme has um, and this is probably accurate and i say probably because nobody really knows for sure even to this day exactly how all these different enzymes work and there may be examples where the lock in key model is accurate because not all reactions are reversible some are but some aren't reversible or some need a different enzyme to reverse so it's it's all very complex and nobody has the perfect answer and you'll see that a lot in science um, there's a lot of things that we don't know um, but, but these are the, the two ideas around enzymes. All enzymes, let's say it one more time, um, only have the ability to bind a, a small number of reactants or products. But the question is, can the uh, enzyme's active site change shape? And it, it would appear a lot of the time, the answer is, is certainly yes with this induced fit model. But there may be other examples where the lock and key model um, still is, is accurate in some circumstances in the body. All I would ask on an exam is that you know the basic difference between the lock and key model and the induced fit model.